Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everybody. So today, inshallah, um, we're going to continue the hadith, uh, the 13th hadith in al Arbain Nawiyah. Hadith is very, uh, very simple. An Abi Hamzata Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu ta'ala anhu khadim rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal la yu'minu ahadukum حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. Now this hadith رواه البخاري ومسلم. When we say رواه البخاري ومسلم, that would actually mean that it was narrated by the most two authentic resources, which is البخاري and مسلم. Now, the hadith, al-Bukhari, uh, hadith is al-Bukhari and Muslim. In another term, it is actually called muttafaqun alayh. Muttafaqun alayh, meaning it is agreed upon between the two most important figures that this hadith is authentic. This hadith is authentic. Um, so the hadith, of course, was narrated by Abi Hamza Anas ibn Malik. Abi Hamza Anas ibn Malik. Now, Abi Hamza is his kunya, his nickname. And Anas ibn Malik, Anas ibn Malik is basically his, um, his own name. Anas ibn Malik um, is Malik ibn Nadr ibn Dandam ibn Zayd ibn Haram ibn Jundab ibn Amir ibn Ghanam ibn Adi ibn Najjar. So he's from Bani Najjar. And Bani Najjar are actually the family that relates to the 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 uncles for the Prophet Sallam. So they're they're pretty much around the Amina bin Tuwahab's family. They're her tribe. And of course they uh, they were in Medina even from before Hijrah. And uh, Anas ibn Malik himself was actually born uh, before Hijrah by 10 years. So when the Prophet Sallam had died he was 20 years. His mother Umm Sulaim had actually Umm Sulaim, and her name is Mulaika bint Malhan in Najari. Now, the family of ben, uh, bint Malhan, by the way, the Malhan family, Umm Sulaim and Haram ibn Malhan. So you've got a number, the uh, Malhan family, they actually had embraced Islam, the whole family. Now, Mulaika herself, when she had embraced Islam, her own husband had left her, and it was Anas. It was Anas that was left, and of course, Al Bara ibn Malik. Now, Al Bara ibn Malik is basically the uh, the biological brother for Anas ibn Malik. His father left them, and because Mulaika, which is Umm Salim, had become Muslim, and when she became Muslim, um, her husband decided to even leave to Bilad al-Sham, to even leave the whole city, everywhere, everything, and just leave it when the Prophet ﷺ had come. So Umm Sulaim, because she wanted her own son Anas to learn from the Prophet ﷺ, so she goes to the Prophet ﷺ and she says, هَذَا أُنَيْسٌ إِبْنِي غُلَامٌ لَبِيبٌ كَاتَبٌ أَتَيْتُكَ بِهِ يَخْدُمُكَ فَادْعُ اللَّهَ لَهَ so, Umm Sulaim comes to the Prophet Sallam and she says, this is Unais. Unais is more of like a cuddling, nicknaming. Uh, somebody, instead of saying Anas, so they would say Unais. Um, so she said, this is Unais. This is my son, Ibni. He's my, my son. And I want, and sorry, she said, Ghulamun Labibun Katib. Ghulam, Ibni, Ghulam. Ghulam meaning he's a young boy. Labib, Labib means smart. Ataytuka bihi yakhdumuk. I brought him to you in order for him to serve. In other, in other words, for him to be there, um, you know, around you, you know, if you need anything, that he'll be there to give it to you, etc. Fadrullahala, make dua for him. So the Prophet ﷺ said the dua. And he said, Allahumma akthar malahu wa waladahu wa atil umurahu wa ghfir dhanbah. He said, Ya Allah, let him have or uh, bless him with lots of wealth 
lots of children and make them live long and ya Allah forgive his sin so Anas ibn Malik later actually was one of the wealthiest Sahaba and he had over 120 grandchildren over 120 grandchildren Anas ibn Malik Anas ibn Malik himself um, Anas ibn Malik himself will let you tell us the story Zainab inshallah Anas ibn Malik himself later actually lived to almost 110 years old almost 110 years old um, Anas ibn Malik was not able to participate in Badr because he was still young but he did actually participate with the Prophet ﷺ in eight different battles from them is Khaybar, Ta'if, Hunayn and he was also there during the opening and the grand victory over Mecca and was also there during Salh al Hudaybiyah. And this is really important when we talk about Salh al Hudaybiyah. Um, it, remember the ayah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had, um, had um, been pleased with the people that were in Bayat al Radwan, that, that were in that pledge during the Radwan pledge. And he was also there with Umrat al Qaba, and he was also there during the farewell Hajj. During the farewell Hajj. Now, after the death of the Prophet, after the death of the Prophet, um, uh, uh, Abu Bakr al Siddiq had actually, uh, of course, taken over after the, the death of the Prophet. And Anas ibn Malik was one of those um, was one of those that actually participated in the Battle of Ridda. And in fact, he was one of those main bow and arrow professionals, one of the best on bow and arrows. And he was one of those that had participated in the Battle of Al Yamama. Now, this and other events, I guess the one of the most important things that we need to discuss about. Uh, about um, Anas ibn Malik is that because he was in and with the household of, within the household of the Prophet ﷺ, because he was a young boy, he was observing the Prophet ﷺ in every single corner. He was observing the Prophet ﷺ in in all matters. In fact, he narrated one time in one of those hadith that he had seen. So the Prophet ﷺ was. Um, I guess changing his his clothes and he said that is Anas ibn Malik he said I had seen the scar from the hadith al Shaqqa Sadr meaning the the event when the Prophet Sallam's chest was open and the Prophet Sallam said that um, the Malaika told him Hada haddu shaytani mink and then they threw it they said this is what shaytan uses uh, what shaytan uses what shaytan uses um, on you and then they threw it. So speaking of that, we could see that the Prophet um, had Anas ibn Malik who was living closely with him and who was, well, Anas ibn Malik was living closely with the Prophet وسلم, and observing each and every single corner. Here's the thing, is that notice that the Prophet وسلم, was teaching this young boy, this young boy, Anas ibn Malik, who was at the time, um, just a few years old, still about 11, 12 years old. And the Prophet ﷺ was teaching him, لَا يُؤْمِنُ أَحَدُكُمْ حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِأَخِيهِ مَا يُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِهِ That one would not be a believer unless you would love for your brother what you love for yourself. This is a very important lesson to teach from early childhood, that in order to be a good believer, you have to learn how to love for your brother what you love for yourself. And that in order to be within, uh, within the Muslim community, there are certain things that you have to raise within yourself. There are certain adab. But here's a, here are a number of questions. When you say, لَا يُؤْمِنُ أَحَدُكُمْ You're talking about, you're talking about Nafil Iman. You're talking about that here, it is considering that the person would not have any faith unless they love for their brother, brother what they love for themselves. But here's one thing, is that is it necessarily a completion of faith that you will not be considered a believer unless you love for your brother what you love for yourself? Scholars had 
um, clarified this point and said, لا يؤمن أحدكم. It doesn't necessarily mean that the the person would not be a believer uh, in his own Islam, but it would mean that his Islam is not complete. And this is really important to say because it would mean that in order for you to increase your status, increase your level of Iman, you have to you have to add on to it a number of different actions, a number of different behaviors. Because Islam in itself is not enough for you to enter Jannah. This is so scary. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ in one of the hadith, the Sahabi, one Sahabi would tell the Prophet ﷺ that, you know, he does what everybody else is doing, etc. And the Prophet ﷺ said, what, what are you going to enter Jannah with? And that's why when we speak about when we speak about لا يؤمن أحدكم, the Prophet وسلم, the Prophet وسلم is bringing it to our attention that there are certain things that you have to upgrade, that you have to constantly work on. And here it's talking لا حتى يحب, that behavior is not only on the outside, but there are certain things to increase your iman, even if it's something that involves on the inside. Did we really get to the level where not only are we sharing, but deep on the inside, we're enjoying sharing. We love sharing. We love for others what we love for ourselves. Now, when we look at that, that's a very, that's a very hard thing to do. But you want to know one thing, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not burden us or obligate something on us or mandate something on us or request something on us more than what we can handle when we look at Anas ibn Malik the Prophet ﷺ is teaching him this adab this adab from early childhood which is telling us something about parenting that when you teach parenting and when we talk about parenting, there's one very important side is that we teach children how, not only children, but we teach even when we're raising our children, we teach them even the highest levels of Iman because they will learn that to strive to become better Muslims, it also involves knowing what level you're, you're supposed to get to. Two, knowing what it is in order for you to strive to get there. Number three, don't think of children as they're too young and don't burden them more than what they can handle and all that. Although technically, or let me say it is true, that their capacity is not like an adult's capacity. But part of disciplining them, it actually happens when they're young. When we look at the great scholars that had lived, in Imam al Nawawi, Zahabi, Ibn Hajar, and the list goes on and on with a lot of those scholars, they actually were learning Islam and learning Quran and learning discipline from the very early childhood. Take in Nawawi. In Nawawi, when his father noticed that he was a he was going to be something somebody great, somebody big. This young child during the day of Ramadan says, Dad, do you see that there's a light around the house? Dad was confused. And dad woke his wife up and he said, do you see anything? And she said, I don't see anything. But it isn't until in Nawawi, in Nawawi brought it up and that's how his dad, his father knew that there was something behind this child even though he was seven years old at the time. His own father was really just a store uh, keeper. He was just, you know, a storekeeper at this shop in where he was selling, selling some, some stuff. He wasn't that rich. And Inouye himself happens to be one of those people that, that participate and even take care of that store. Inouye later becomes that that um, that storekeeper that is 
trying to find every single minute, every single minute to use in order to memorize the Quran. How old was he? He was only about 10 years old at the time. But he was making use of every single minute. During our day and age, we're always told, especially in the West, they need the time to play. They need the time for entertainment. And kids and children are given so much of so much time for entertainment that unfortunately, when they reach the age of puberty, they have not yet reached the age of puberty and maturity in their minds. Why? Because unfortunately, we have been we have been living in a culture where it's all about entertainment. But here, the Prophet ﷺ was teaching Anas ibn Malik that it is more than entertainment. You, there's a level to reach, and that level to reach is a level where even your iman is is included, where you even work on your iman on the inside to let your children reach that level for, or strive to reach it from early childhood. No time to waste. It, it includes changing the inside. It includes disciplining yourself from the inside and that later will fruit into bringing in justice in our behavior. Where does the, state, uh, the, the change start? The change starts from the inside. Ilhub, where is love? Where is love and where is that affection, that affection in our heart start? It actually starts within our heart. Where, when and how does it start? Well, it starts by disciplining ourselves from early childhood or from the second that we actually embrace Islam. And it also, it also starts, and you will see our behavior changing when it actually starts on the inside. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the, 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 the Ansar and how they were re relating with the Muhajireen, those immigrants that were coming to Medina. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا يُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ That they would prefer others. And those others were pretty much those poor immigrants that were coming to Medina. That they would prefer them even if they were facing the utmost hunger. خَصَاصًا وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا Even if they are extremely hungry, but they will prefer them and give them what they would want for themselves. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had described, described the people of Medina and the Ansar and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes them is in order for us to take them as role models. But any change will not happen unless we actually put it into the inside first into our hearts to embrace the principle of giving, to embrace the principle of loving for others what you love for yourself. When we embrace that giving and the enjoyment of giving, and it's not only giving, but it is also that you would deal with the same principle that you would like for yourself, because humans we, it is part of our instinct that we are selfish beings, that we worry are about ourselves, we worry about our life, we worry about our property, we worry about our reputation, we worry about everything that involves us because that's what keeps us going in life. So we fear any changes because it will reflect our weakness. But for a believer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us that no, just as you fear about some of those weaknesses for yourself, it is part of your iman that you would be considerate over others' weaknesses and that you would be considerate. It is exactly like the golden rule that you would be considerate over others' rights just as you would be considerate over your rights and what preserves your potentials and what preserves your strength on all matters. So the hadith, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه until what you love for your brother, what you would love for yourself, it doesn't include or is not only speaking about property, but it is including 
many sides of life, whether that meant on justice, rights, reputation, and the list goes on and on, that you would have to be considerate over others' properties, over others' needs. And the word needs is a very comprehensive word in a very comprehensive term. And that's why even the word uh, the word ma is actually to mean that it is not defining any specific item but it is leaving it unidentified for any matter to be included as whatever it is that your brother loves you have to also include giving them what they love as much as what you want for the things that you love to be preserved preserving others life preserving others others um, chastity preserving others mind preserving others property is from the very foundation of justice not only preserving it but also considering it as much as you consider your own matters is actually iman itself so when the uh, when the hadith says la yu'minu this is actually speaking about an iman to mean that it will not be complete unless you consider unless you consider such matters and you live to strengthen it now when we look at the hadith we see in a hadith that was narrated by muslim that wallahi la yu'min wallahi la yu'min wallahi la yu'min the Prophet ﷺ said, by Allah, they would not be believers. They would not be believers. They would not be believers. And when they inquired on who, the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ said, Whoever, whoever's neighbor is not secure from his harm. If this is the neighbor, how is it if it was your own family member, your own sister, your own brother, your own family? Teaching it to our children, teaching it to our the, the adults is actually part of Islam. That you cannot be a true mu'min, you can't be a true believer unless you actually change from the inside. But when we speak about la yu'min, this is very this is very common in many ahadith where the Prophet ﷺ actually says, لا يزني الزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن ولا يسرق السارق حين يسرق وهو مؤمن ولا يشرب القمر حين يشربها وهو مؤمن There is another hadith where the Prophet ﷺ actually said that a person when they commit adultery or fornication while they're committing it, they would not be believers at the moment, at the time of committing it. And when same thing, when somebody steals, when somebody steals, the, during that moment, while they are stealing, they would not be considered as mu'mineen at the time. And same thing when somebody is drinking. During the time of drinking, they would not be considered that they're believers at the time. But here, this is not necessarily that iman is taking away completely, but al-imanu yazidu wa yanqus. Iman Iman, meaning faith, can increase and de decrease depending. It would increase with good action and it would decrease with sin. Now here, when we look at major sin, we could see that the Prophet ﷺ was including major sin in this hadith where he says, When the Prophet ﷺ actually talked about that, it doesn't mean that the iman is totally gone. And even if the person had committed a major sin, committing a major sin, it doesn't take away the iman from you, but it definitely, it definitely has this, uh, this effect the effect on a person's heart and it will have later uh, uh, in the in the future it may have a large impact it may have a large impact in, in fact it was narrated by Jabir ibn Abdullah that uh, that that was actually part of the words of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak that la uh, sorry that the, uh, that the person is naqis al-iman that the person their faith 
is just less. And it is exactly like this. It's exactly like when somebody is what Abdullah ibn Rawaha and Abu Darda, they said that Iman, faith, is just like a garment. It's just like a garment or a cloak where a person may put it on them and may sometimes take it off. But the official out, uh, the official part of their Islam is there, which is telling us that in order to grow in our Iman and to maintain, remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ The dress of taqwa is best. What is the dress of taqwa? The dress of taqwa, it's exactly like what Abdullah ibn Rawaha and Abu Darda were saying, that faith is like a cloak. It's like an outer garment. You may decide to take it off and you may decide to keep it on. But, لِبَاسُ التَّقْوَى ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ that garment of taqwa, the garment of iman, is the best. That's the highest level. But in order to stay with libas or taqwa, one has to maintain the main foundations of Islam in their heart and even in their behavior. Now, when we look at... Sorry, that's my son singing in the background. Um, when we look at... Um, this hadith, it also reminds us that the Prophet وسلم, based on the hadith that was narrated by Ahmed, من حديث, ibn Mu'ad, من حديث Mu'ad, that he asked the Prophet وسلم, an afdali iman. He asked the Prophet وسلم, about the best of the iman. So the Prophet وسلم, responded, قَالَ أَفْضَلُ الْإِمَانِ أَن تُحِبَّ اللَّهُ وَتَبْغَضُ لِلَّهُ وتعمل, لسان, وَتَعْمَلْ لسان, لِسَانَكَ فِي ذِكْرِ اللَّهُ That the best of level of iman is when you love for the sake of Allah and when you hate for the sake of Allah and you're constantly letting your tongue work on one main thing, which is dhikr. And here, when we look at, when we look at the Prophet ﷺ completing the explanation, and then he said, أَن تُحِبَّ لِلنَّاسِ مَا تُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِكَ When you love for people what you love for yourself and you hate, what you hate for yourself. And an taqula khayran aw tasmut. Or you would say what is good. Or if you can't say what is good, you stay quiet. Now, when you look at this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was teaching us that how do I grow to become part of those that will love for others as much as they love for themselves? The Prophet ﷺ tells us that you love for the sake of Allah and you hate for the sake of Allah. What does loving for the sake of Allah actually mean? Loving for the sake of Allah means, let me explain it and break it down. At any time when you love somebody, love, it's that, that inner feeling, that inner feeling where a person might actually have some inner inclinations. Those inner inclinations that you have towards somebody actually result for a number of reasons. Maybe because you have something in common. You love the same things. You, you spend time with them. And these times that you spend with somebody, they may later on develop into loving or liking somebody. Now, keeping in mind that when we speak of dealing with somebody that builds in a relationship, that builds in a connection, and as humans, we are very social beings. What it means to be very social beings that when somebody is around us and we constantly are dealing with them, it love doesn't happen with a snap. Love, it's accumulated feelings that develop as time. And that's why the best, of the, the best of the love is that love that's built on ishra. When you have a purpose, when you, have, when you share a purpose, when you share a common good, when you share, uh, when you share lots of activities that you do with one another. And that's why we could see in our times a lot of marriages failing because it's built on fantasy. And not like before, where 
they were building out on purpose. They had the purpose for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's why those marriages lasted. They were built that we are here working on the same goal, the goal to get to Jannah, the goal to get to raise our children and that we both submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't submit to one another, but we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only reason why I may obey or I will obey my husband is for no reason, It's but for one reason, which is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered me to do so. Once we humble ourselves and uh, humble ourselves and submit ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then everything else becomes becomes that point in where the reason why I'm committed to, for example, obeying my husband is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered me to do so. And he understands that the reason why I'm obeying him is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered me to do so and not because he somehow is superior. Now, when we have that, when we have that understanding fixed, then we would understand that it's not in any form of slavery, but it is actually a whole concept of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Same thing here, that when you love, you love somebody, and that's why the, the Prophet actually says that Part of the things that you want to do is that لا يأكل طعامك. طعامك. Don't let, don't share food. Don't share food and don't eat except with a believer. Why? Because it's not an issue of, oh, I shouldn't be sharing food. But it's an issue of telling you, who are you spending your time with? Eating, drinking, and entertaining yourself with. Once that starts happening frequently, then you got to remember that there's one thing that you may not recognize starting to accumulate in your heart, and that is love. That will start to build up in your heart, and later there are many obligations that you will have to do. And many times we may not realize that when we speak about loving for the sake of Allah, that the main reason I may not have met X or Y, I didn't meet them, I never saw them before, but I only love them for one thing, is because they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is because we share the same purpose, is because we share, we share the same, we share, we share the same a love, which is the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and love for Jannah. And even in Akhirah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مِنْ غِلْ إِخْوَانًا عَلَى سُرِرِ الْمُتَقَابِلِينَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we have uprooted, نَزَعْنَا, it is totally uprooted. What is uprooted? نَزَعْنَا مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مِنْ غِلْ Every single, every single animosity that might have remained in their heart from the time of dunya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take it away. What is that telling us? In order to make your home a Jannah, the first thing that you want to do is take away the hate, is take away the feeling that you are competing, whether it's your husband or whether it's your brother or sister. You don't want that hate, that animosity to be inside your heart because it will develop in a different type of attention and it will come on the surface of our behavior where we will start to, to not love the good for them but love that any anything evil would happen to them and that's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had forbid hasad and even made it part of the Quran that we read min sharri hasidin idha hasad qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq min sharri ma khalaq wa min sharri ghasiqin idha waqab min sharri naffathat fi al-'uqad wa min sharri ghasiqin idha waqab wa min sharri hasidin idha hasad and we would seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from those that will envy from the evils of their envy the envy is a result of that feeling, that hateful feeling, that, that hateful feeling that we might have on the inside, that is considered the most dangerous thorn in any relationship. 
in any relationship that hate that some will conceal will not show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told you know it is going to be part of what increases your iman that you work on even the slightest amount of it that may not be apparent to others even if it's on the inside so here what that you would when you hate you don't want to deal with somebody or etc why because they're away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they're distant you don't want to deal with them why because you worry that they might actually take you to a different place how do you start to make those changes remember you want to start to make those changes by you yourself what you talk about what you talk about is going to eventually affect the type of relationship you deal with people if your tongue is constantly doing dhikr or speaking of the rightful things right by that point the people that are going to gather around you are the people that are going to be interested in the topics that you're going to be talking about if you're constantly talking about politics the people that are going to gather around you are the people that love talking about politics the people that love drama are the ones that are going to be gathering it in order to engage in drama and the people that are constantly using profanity constantly using let's just say illicit language and you are accustomed to it and your ear becomes accustomed to it eventually your ear will start to go on your 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 words what you constantly are hearing is going to affect what you were constantly say and you will eventually start using that type of language if your tongue is constantly listening to the words of Allah listening to the words of dhikr then eventually the words that will start rising on your mouth that will start passing through your mouth are basically the words of dhikr now when we look at that hadith we see that the prophet sallallahu gave us how to change that was what was what is within our heart to make it love for the sake of allah and to make it love for and to take away all that greed and selfishness that we might have in our hearts so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was telling us well you got to change those particular items when you engage with somebody make sure you engage with the right people and when you distance yourself from certain people make sure you distance yourself also from particular people because eventually it will rub off on you you will start unconsciously when you're not even conscious about it you will start replicating their actions you will start imitating them in the way they speak in the way they they behave in the entertainment in their jokes and it will be who you are now having that been been said the prophet sallallahu was telling us that an taqula khairan aw tasmu that you would say what is good or you stay quiet why because that's going to put that's the key to putting the right people around you and there the prophet sallallahu alaihi was telling us those different levels those different guidelines in order to enter jannah that you have to consider have to consider those those sides in another hadith where the prophet sallallahu alaihi actually asked one of the sahaba atuhibbul jannah in this hadith um, it was uh, the Prophet Sallam asking Yazid ibn Asad al Qasri, Atuhibbul Jannah, do you love Jannah? So he responded, Yes. So the Prophet Sallam said, Fa'ahibbali akhik ma tuhibbuli nafsik. Then love for your brother what you would love for yourself. In another hadith in Sayyid Muslim, and hadith from Hadith Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As, on the Prophet Sallam, 
that the Prophet Sallam, and this is Amr, uh, Amr ibn al-As. Let me tell you a story about Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As was sitting with the Prophet Sallam, but here's the thing. The Prophet Sallam, because he was so affectionate, he was making the Sahaba, all of them, feel that he loved them all. Amr ibn al-As thought he was the Prophet Sallam's favorite. So he asked the Prophet Sallam, who's your favorite? So the Prophet ﷺ responded, Aisha. He loves Aisha the most. He said, no, no, I mean from the men. He said, Abuha, her father. So he said, then who? And then he started naming the Sahaba one. And he would say, then who? One after another, after another. And then Amr ibn al As said, I wish I never asked because the Prophet ﷺ never made him feel that he didn't really love him the most, but it isn't until he had asked. Now, that's one thing, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تسألوا عن أشياء تبدأ لكم تسؤكم. Don't ask about matters that if, if you were to know the truth of it, it may harm you. Not always do you necessarily want to know the details about everything, not every question you need to know. That's to help you. That's to help you at least stay with your honor. To help you at least stay with your honor. Now, when um, when Amr ibn al As asked the question about, you know, also about love, the Prophet ﷺ actually told him that whoever uh, whoever dies believing in Allah and Judgment Day. And they would hate to go in hellfire as much um, that who would it, they would hate to go into hellfire and even enter Jannah. And they would die hating to go to hellfire and loving to go to Jannah. And he would yati ila nasi ladhi yuhibbu an yu'ta ilay. And that he would do and offer to people what he would love people for, to offer him, he would be the person that will be yuzahzah anin nar. He would be the person that would be, the word yuzahzah would mean that they would be slipped away from Jannah, from hellfire, that they would be slipped, they would be pulled out from hellfire. Now, a lot really to say about this hadith, but in the end, is that it is very important that part of our iman that we learn that you, in order to change your behavior, you got to start from within. You got to start from within. And the other part I would like to add it's so easy to put on a mask with strangers, but with family members, we usually relate with our own behavior, who we really are, and our own family members. Unfortunately, most of the problems I see are really within the family. Why? Because you can easily distance yourself from a stranger or somebody that you may not like. You can easily distance yourself away from them. But when it's your family members, they will get to see those moments when you are, let's say, very upset, very angry. And usually when we're very upset and when we're angry, we don't necessarily abide by all the integrity, by the akhlaq that we, when, that we would practice when we are at ease. Because when we're angry, we tend to forget all of the sudden about all morality. And some will go to the level of probably breaking things, pushing, using words that they should not be using, etc. And then we would forget that the Prophet ﷺ actually said, لا تغضب. Don't be angry because you will lose your akhlaq then. And that's what we all need to work on. And at many times, when you would ask 
the, the, the children, you would ask the people around you about their family members. They're always complaining that strangers have more respect to them than their own family members. Don't look at how strangers, don't um, look at how strangers are actually dealing with you and look at your family members and what they're doing because they more know about you and about those swings, the mood swings that you will have and how your behavior changes. Listen to what your mother and father and your sisters and your family members might comment on some of the behavior changes that you need to engage in. And not necessarily the strangers. Strangers will only see you during the mode of professional mode when you're pretty much in that calmness mode. But those that are at home, your husband, your family members, your brothers, your sisters, they will see you during your angry mode, your happy mode, your sad mode, etc. So to work on our Islam, when we can't see ourselves unless we stand in front of a mirror, meaning what? Your own husband, your own brothers and sisters, the people around you, the closest people around you are pretty much the most people that can help you reflect on yourself and tell you what you need to change about yourself. Because you can't really see yourself unless you stand in front of a mirror. And when you're angry, and when you're in pretty much most of the day, you don't stand in front of the mirror all day. You stand in front of the mirror occasionally, maybe a minute or two or three, four, max 20 minutes. That's the max. But everyone around you, even during a, a, an hour conversation, they're the ones that are seeing you and you're not seeing yourself. You could just see one side of yourself, which is how you feel on the inside. But that does not necessarily reflect all the behavior. You don't see yourself in here. When we see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the Prophet was telling us about لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخي ما يحب لنفسه This is also including actions. How would you want others to deal with you with a smile? Or every single time they see you, they're constantly fighting with you. Is that what you're doing? You might say, I don't know why they're always treating me that way. Maybe you should start asking yourself, how are you treating them? Are they a reflection of what you are doing? Are they a reflection of what you're doing when they see you, they all of a sudden become traumatized by looking at you? Or do they see akhlaq and that's why they'll deal with you with honor? When they see akhlaq and they deal with you with honor, that's to help you realize that moment, that moment, who am I and what am I? Am I really that mu'min that the Prophet ﷺ had talked about? Now, when we look at when we look at those different hadith and how the Prophet ﷺ was teaching those sahaba or teaching them from early childhood and how he was telling them that مثل المؤمن في المؤمنين في توادهم توادهم وتعاطفهم وتراحمهم مثل الجسد إذا اشتكى منه عضو تداعى له سائر الجسد بالسهر والحمى أو بالحمى والسهر. And this hadith is narrated in the Sahihain. In Nu'man ibn Bashir, he narrated the hadith that the Prophet Sallam said that the believers in their one توادهم that تواد is like their affection. تعاطفهم, their emotion to one another, تراحمهم, their mercy, their support to one another is exactly like one body. Where one, one side of the body, one gland, one part of the body might fall ill, but the rest of the body will actually 
work towards either correcting or might even show a symptom that one side of the body is not feeling good. If that is the situation with the mu'mineen in general within a community, that should be the case even at home. Even at home. Like I said many times, it's so easy to put on this mask in public, but we have to put on, not a mask, but we have to put on libas taqwa We have to put on libas taqwa by first putting in what the Prophet ﷺ was talking about, which is verily, verily, there is one piece of flesh in the body. If it changes, the rest of the body changes. And that's the heart. It begins with the heart, and then the rest of the body will change based on what the heart is like. When we change what is within the heart, the rest of our behavior changes. If we take away the hate, if we take away the envy, we take away that, that greed, we will see that we will then be willing to share. We will then be willing to be just and be fair. And then we will be willing to act with good manners because on the inside we're good. We will be willing to give up feeling our, ourselves as if we are the center and everything else is the margin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tilka darul akhira. Najahaluha lilladina la yuriduna huluwa fil ardi wala fasada. Wala aqibatu lil muttaqin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Qasas, that last destination, destination on Judgment Day, we had preserved it for those that don't want to be that don't want to be proud on this earth and don't want destruction. And in the end, the highest rank is for those that are muttaqeen, for those that practice taqwa, that practice justice, that practice their behavior is based on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had defined. Now when we look at when we look at this ayah, it tells us that there's a specific thing that we have to practice in this hadith. La yu'minu ahadukum hatta yakun uh, is basically relating to this ayah. It's teaching us how is it that we can have ulu? How is it that we can have that pride? We can have that where we see others are less than us. If you feel that you are better in any way and that others are less than you, then you have paved your way to hellfire. Even if you are doing the right thing, the Prophet ﷺ in the hadith and narrated by Tirmidhi, he said that there are certain people that they're going to be entering hellfire first. And he said, one, he talked about a person that recited the Qur'an, learned the Qur'an, might have learned the Qur'an, the Qur'an, but the Prophet ﷺ said that they will, he will enter hellfire. Why? Because he wanted pride. He wanted fame. He wanted to be presented as al qil, And it was said he was a Qari'. Everybody knew him as the reciter, as the Qur'an scholar. But he will enter, enter hellfire because he was seeking pride. Another person he talked about, which is a person that engaged in jihad he was really striving hard but the prophet ﷺ said that they will enter hellfire why because they were seeking pride they were seeking to be remembered for their courage and their their courage and their power and and striving for for islam etc 
probably positions, and they did get the position. They did get probably a rank in the military or maybe in the government. They did get it. And people recognized them for that position. So the Prophet ﷺ said, and people did recognize them for that position, but they will still enter hellfire. And thirdly, he also talked about a scholar, that the scholar, people knew him that he was a sheikh or a sheikha. He was defined and recognized by a label of sheikh, sheikha, scholar, all those different labels. And every time anybody wanted a question, they will turn the, to them for an answer. But still, what they were concerned about is really pride. So the Prophet ﷺ said, they got the pride. They got the position. They got the label. That's what they seeked after all. But on Judgment Day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he knows deep on the inside and what they were really after, they weren't after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They didn't have the sincerity. So on Judgment Day, they will be the ones to actually enter hellfire, even though they got the label that they wanted. And even though they were scholars, they were in the highest ranking positions, at least, to the people. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said they will not enter hell. They will not enter Jannah. They will actually enter, enter hellfire. Now, when we look at this, um, one, when we say لا يؤمن أحدكم, that they would not even want that others would be better than them, but they will actually want others to also go into succession, success also, just as they want themselves to be in success. So how do we understand the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ actually says لا حسد إلا, لا حسد إلا فتنتين that there's no envy except in two matters. And he mentioned a person with lots of money and, and lots of money and, and, and spending it for the sake of Allah. And he also mentioned somebody else. And that other person is basically the person that um, that has the, the, the ilm and the iman, etc. But the reason that he mentioned the envy is not the envy where you wish that the person's blessings would go away, but you would wish you would wish that you had the same blessings to do the same righteousness. That type of envy is actually a positive and a good envy. Why? Because it will motivate you to do more. It will motivate you to try to replicate those pious people. And that's a good envy. This is not included here. And anyways, the envy in where you would wish that somebody would become bad is actually is actually an evil envy. And that's why when we look at the reason why when we see it actually starts with pride. In fact, there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says that no one will enter Jannah if they had one iota of pride in their heart. Now that's why that when we look at the hadith, when we look at the hadith that al-baghi will kibr batar al-haq, kibr, kibr, pride and oppression is actually a main obstacle to perceiving, to perceiving justice. The reason why people oppress others is because it started out with them hating them and then without them realizing that became an obstacle it be, it started out with condescending others and making them feel or you thinking that you are somehow superior and therefore having the right to oppress you don't define it as oppression you will define it as the fair social action to retaliate to certain behavior. That's how we will convince ourselves 
that we're not guilty for what we are harming others with. Because we will give ourselves to the justification that they deserved it. That that was a way to bring them back to justice. That they are inherently evil. Therefore, this is fair. Whether it's my mother-in-law, my in-laws in general, my the people around me, we will tend to explain it to ourselves that it's okay. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about uh, it tells us فَخَرَجَ عَلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فِي زِينَتِهِ قَالَ الَّذِينَ يُرِيدُونَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا يَا لَيْتَ لَنَا مِثْلَ مَا أُوْتِيَ قَارُونَ This is قَارُونَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about, about him that he came out with his jewelry, with his money, with all the things that reflected his magnificent, magnificent wealth. They all said, إِنَّهُ لَذُوْ حَظًّا عَظِيمٌ He's so lucky. Look at the, look at the wealth that he has. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ وَيْلَكُمْ ثَوَابُ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لِمَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا Those that had what? أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ Those that had knowledge. What knowledge? It's not a PhD. And certainly, it's not any degree. أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ They were given the right perspective. They were given the perspective to see things in their real nature. What did they say? وَيْلَكُمْ ثَوَابُ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ لِمَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا Woe unto you, you know, the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better for those that believe and do what is good. That is the most important knowledge that you can have. And that's why the ayah said, الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ Those that were granted ilm. Because ilm, yes, having knowledge in science and physics, yes, that is a kind of ilm. But the real ilm is the ilm of your own self and your own life and the purpose behind it. And putting things around you in, perspe in perspective. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَتَمَنَّوْ مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضَكُمْ عَلَى بَعْضُ And don't wish what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given others for yourself. Meaning what? This ayah was actually revealed because Ummu Salama had wished that she was a man. And the reason why is because she had wished that, you know, maybe we could do the jihad, we could be with you, we could accompany you, we could do all these different things that men get to do. So the ayah that we revealed, don't wish to have what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given others. What is don't given others? Men, you've got certain trying, certain qualities. And ladies, you also have certain qualities. Don't wish to be men. And men don't wish to be women. And this is teaching us even to wish to be a man or to wish to be a woman in Islam is haram, let alone even pretending to be a man or to pretending to be a woman. Now, when we look at that hasad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was teaching us how to consider what is the right thing to compete for. What is the right thing to compete for? That you compete, you compete in piety. You compete in getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what you want to compete in and not, not the dunya. Certainly not the dunya because everything will vanish in it. Everything will vanish in it, and the only thing that will remain is really your amal. Everything will be wiped out from every single particle of your body. To be arrogant and consider yourself beyond others or above others over what? <clears throat> over what? The same exact 
the same exact substances that your body is made of is the same exact substance that other people's bodies are made of. Does it make you of any of any honor because of your looks or because of the wealth that you have? Because all that will eventually vanish. And the only thing that will remain is your action. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَفِي ذَلِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافِسِ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ And let them, let them race, let them compete in ذَلِك. What is ذَلِك? ذَلِك is referring to الْآخِرَة. ذلك is referring to الآخرة. Lots to say. This is just in brief. So we won't take so long. جزاكم الله خير on everybody. And somebody wanted to share a story. Um, Zainab, Sister Zainab, you wanted to share a story. So go ahead. Um, Sister Zainab, uh, I don't know if I have you all muted. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, I have questions first. Okay, go ahead. Uh, the hadith that you mentioned, لا يأكلوا لا لا يأكلوا طعامكم ولا يأكلوا من طعامكم لا يأكلوا طعامك إلا مؤمن إلا مؤمن. So this one is that means um, inviting the non-Muslims uh, no, to your food. What is it? No, no, no. Um, it doesn't mean so that you know. There's a difference between. Uh, on occasionally sharing in between between constantly involved with um, with people that are not pious even if it's a muslim if somebody is um let's say uh, a muslim that is not practicing islam you see yeah. when you're constantly eating with them that builds in that builds in a relationship so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the prophet sallam, is teaching us when you want to build a relationship, make sure that you're building a relationship with somebody that is going to elevate your amen, starting from the food sharing that you're sharing. It doesn't mean at all, don't, don't eat with non-Muslims or, or even with bad Muslims, but it's basically telling you, you know, what you're constantly, those daily matters that you're doing, you always want to make sure that those daily matters and those daily activities that you're involved in, make sure that you're, you're sharing it with a believer because that will rub on you. Mm. That will rub on you. Even if it was a small meal, it will rub, rub on you. What you eat and those that you were, that you're going to go probably a long drive, maybe a 9, 10, 11, 17 hour drive or probably traveling from one country to another, it will rub on you. Who are you constantly surrounding? Um, who are you constantly surrounding yourself with? Okay. Inshallah. All right. Mm, oh, yeah. So for the story, uh, like, the, it's a long time ago. Uh, a brother was talking about like uh, polygamy. And then he was saying like he has the capacity financially and all that. And then he mentioned this hadith of لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخي ما يحب لنفسه. So I told him that's wonderful. Like because he put me in the spot like how dare you, you don't accept that your sister, don't you love your other sister and this and that. I was like, okay, that's fair. I thought, so what about we save a brother who is single from the zina and temptation by sponsoring his marriage, by sponsoring his life, and in that way, you're taking the ajr of two, not the ajr of one. That way, you love two, not just loving one. So that was the story. That's why I said, like, this hadith, like I have a story with it, so subhanallah. Right. I'm not saying like don't don't you guys do polygamy, but he was a brother who was using. I mean, for me in the time and what I observed, he was using the Islam in his side, and he was not using it in the fair way. So I was like, okay, you want to play smart, you can play smart too. So may Allah guide us all. Amen, Rabbi. I forgot to mention Anas ibn Malik. Um, 
died at 90, yeah. well, between 90 and 93 Hijrah. And he actually had a dangerous disease, which is leprosy um, oh. at the end of his life. And, and leprosy is one of, it's, it's actually a nerve disease or a neurological mm -hmm. disease in where it affects a person's nerves from feeling pain. Oh. And then they eventually start losing their limbs, start losing their sight, start losing their, their hearing. Um, and it, affect, it uh, eventually, it affects their ability. It affects their ability to um, function in many different ways. And then they eventually die because of, uh, because of the general weakness. And Anas ibn Malik, Anas ibn Malik uh, died in Al-Basra. Al-Basra is a city in al Iraq, And he had more than 129 grandchildren. Remember the dua that the Prophet Sallam actually, um, actually mentioned. And he had, um, and he had um, um, uh, many gardens. And those gardens were actually bringing fruits two times a year, which is you know this is this is very rare and abu huraira actually used to say ma ra'aytu ahadan ashbaha bi salati rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wasallam min ibni sulaim bin min ibni ummu sulaim sorry he used to say i'd never saw somebody um praying like the prophet sallallahu as ibn umm sulaim as the son of umm sulaim and anas ibn sirin said kana anas ibn malik ahsanu an-nas salatan fi al-hadar wa safar he used to say, Anas ibn Malik is the best one to pray, like to for complete and perfect his prayer. Fil hadari wa safar, whether we are in our, you know, residence or within uh, our stay in the city, or whether we are on a journey. And Jazakumullah khairan, and we will see you, inshallah. I guess we'll be off for a whole week because of the Eid and we will be I will be participating in um, in a conference in Michigan inshallah I will put it online as well inshallah and that way you could hear it we're going to talk about Anas ibn Malik uh, not Anas ibn Malik but I mean sorry Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani al-Dhahabi and in Nawawi inshallah so join us then and we'll see you all assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh